Hey, come here. Those e-commerce gurus, they want you to think that the key to a $10 million e-commerce empire lies in Facebook ads, slick landing pages, and whatever else is the current hot tactic. But guess what? They're selling you fairy tales. Why? So you buy into their services. And here's a twist. I'm not selling anything, which means I can spill the real secret to e-commerce success. Are you ready for the truth? It's not about just ads or the latest social media fad. It's about leveraging what really matters. I'm gonna walk you through the four types of leverage that I've mastered. The real game changers behind a multi-million dollar e-commerce machine. No fluff, just the straight facts that transformed my journey. Let's unravel these game changers one by one. I've sold more than $150 million in e-commerce sales over the last handful of years. And the most important lesson that I've learned is specifically about the four different forms of leverage. I originally learned about this from Naval. He had three, but I've added a fourth form that he didn't talk about. I'm gonna tell you exactly what they are, how I've used them and how I've benefited. So the first thing that you need to get good at is your human resources. This is where you're gonna get leverage on people. If you think about entrepreneurs, initially start out as like small business owners. They don't wanna delegate anything because they don't think that other people can do it as well as they can. And one of the most important lessons that I learned tied to human resource leverage was the capability to do 100 units of work in a day. It's like 100%. Even if somebody else isn't as efficient as I am, let's say that they can do 80 units of work a day. If I have five different people working for me, that's generating 400 units of work a day, not inclusive of what I'm able to do. That was a big shift in my mindset, being able to realize that there's so many different things that I know how to do well. If you can simply turn these into standard operating procedures that you can hand off to somebody, you're ready for level one. And level one is getting somebody who either a virtual assistant or somebody who a low cost generalist. The first person that I ever hired was a virtual assistant. What we did is I made a standard operating procedure for how to reach out to micro influencers. Basically, they handled the whole entire process. We documented all of the results that they were able to generate. And the goal is to build marketing flywheels or to build flywheels that produce more output than the cost to operate that particular worker. If you can execute this properly, if you can build these flywheels, I know there's so many small things that each person does every day that you wind up doing and you probably could have handed it off to somebody else. Even in the event that it's not profitable to use a VA or a generalist to do certain tasks, it can elevate you so that you can work on tasks that are more valuable. I've done this with a lot of different things and it's allowed me to be freed up and have much more time focused on strategy than the overwhelm of trying to figure out which task I need to finish next. That's level one. Level two is we get this certain size and you can start to afford to pay people who have like subject matter expertise. When I originally hired our director of marketing who eventually became a VP, he had so much real world marketing experience outside of the digital realm that we were able to complement each other extremely well. And he was able to add a whole nother layer of marketing expertise as well as management skills that I was weaker in. And then the third is forming project specific teams where you have all experts on a very particular topic. This could be things like, you know, trying to move your, uh, your company into new regions or like hiring somebody specifically who is an expert in a channel that you're not an expert in, for instance, retail. I was primarily a digital guy. We also sell in retail. And as fun as it is to, to swim through the waters and figure everything else, everything out on your own, it's so much easier to go and hire somebody who has expertise and can slide in and add value. And then tied to that whole project thing, they can build a team around them to support that side of the business. The next form of leverage that I love is financial leverage. So this is using money or to scale your systems. So this is like a lot of times where you're either gonna get debt from the bank, so you, you, I'll borrow some money so that we can invest further in acquisition. If we have a particular tactic that's working really well, I like to call it hitting a vein. If we hit a vein and the results are absolutely amazing, I want to get as much money, whether it's borrowing it or raising funds through venture capital. I want to leverage that particular tactic as hard as I can while it's working. Now, the three big levels here are you know investing in growth. So you can either borrow money or you can raise money through virtual or uh, virtual assistant through venture 
venture capital or private equity. It's obviously a little bit harder right now that things are, interest rates are high. But the one piece of advice that I'd have here is that when you do this, you wanna make sure that you have a tactic that you can put money in that's effective already and that you're not taking money or borrowing money and just lighting it on fire with tactics that you're unsure of. So always make sure that whatever you're gonna do here is leverageable. We raised, raised money for True Earth a couple of years ago, We've got some fantastic partners and we were able to dramatically grow in, in those couple of years. The second level of financial leverage is taking the profits that you generate and instead of taking dividends and, and enjoying yourself with them, taking the, the, the profits and injecting them back into the company into those tactics. So it's like a flywheel. If your return is strong enough, you can multiply and grow exponentially until obviously you hit a ceiling. And then the third level is leverage bios. So roll-ups, so finding competition that are doing similar things to you. And we did that with one company called Net Zero Co. And it was great. We got a bunch of talent out of it. We got a bunch of customers and we've banded our ability to sell products that eliminate single-use plastics with, without you know clogging up our merchandising on sure. The next layer or the next level of, sorry, it's not a level, the next form of leverage is technology leverage. So there is so much technology out there that can replace some of the tasks that you do day to day, whether it's, you know, things that everybody use like email and CRMs for slicing and dicing audiences and communicating to them to things like data analysis software. So in the past, you have your KPI sheets or you have your data intelligence and you can pull all the data in by hand and you can put it on a spreadsheet and then look at it. But at the end of the day, when you're doing that, there's, well, first of all, it takes human resources. And then second of all, there's room for error. So from a data analysis perspective, technology is a great means to do that. So using a tool, some sort of business intelligence tool in a data lake like Domo or using Google Studios or BigQuery, pulling all the data in using technology or and AI, and then either analyzing it with a human, which again re requires human resources, or now there's lots of opportunities to use AI. Other simple things that we've done, you know, using social media posting tools that allow you to post to multiple places at once, using tools for responding to Facebook ads where you can store canned responses so people can quickly go and respond to commonly asked things, or things even as simple as using like chat GPT to, uh, what's it called, uh, summarize emails. Or one thing that where I use chat GPT all the time is sometimes I don't, I, I'm not the best at structuring my thoughts into text. So I'll just talk my thoughts into Loom or whatever tool you wanna use and take the transcript, run it through chat GPT and say, summarize this and put it in a format that's easy for others to consume. And the final form of leverage that I love, and this is the one that I've added to the mix, is audience. So I want you to think about like, if I'm having a conversation with you, this is very one-on-one. -on -one. Now, if I'm having the same conversation on social media and I'm sending this message out, it takes me the same amount of effort if I'm posting this to post it to one person as it does to post to a million people. And the same thing goes with email. The ability to build an audience that and a community that's actually interested in what you have to say is holds so much leverage. The key with building an audience though is making sure that you keep people engaged. So, you know, for me, it's like making sure that like from me personally here on Twitter is making sure that I jump in and I join conversations. I participate and respond to people who are like commenting on my posts, hopping into DMs and getting to know people a little bit better, things like that. Those are the things that are going to keep your audience engaged. But at the end of the day, it's you want to build an audience who believe in what you say and I guess if you're trying to sell them something have similar problems that you have solutions for but if you can build massive following whether it's on actually you don't even need a massive following if you can build a following and a community on places like Twitter LinkedIn your newsletter your brand community you're gonna have so much leverage because every time that you craft a message as long as you're continuing to build these audiences you're gonna have bigger and bigger results with the same amount of effort hope this video makes sense make sure you leave a comment below if you like it.